All right, so welcome to the panel on uh, mutuality in, around COVID-19 uh, at the Oasis Extraordinary Meeting. Uh, we all have Frank Richter. I think all of us are known to Frank and uh, he's very well known around the world. Hopefully will be much better known after this enormous conference of 900 people. So I think uh, it's appropriate to begin with a little uh, Little thank you note to him for organizing this and bringing all of us on this platform uh, in, a, in such a difficult time. Uh, so thank you, Frank, if you can hear us. And uh, I'm sure all my colleagues here on the panel join me in expressing that, that sentiment. So we'll start with a, with a quick round of introductions and I'll uh, make a couple of opening remarks uh, as we speak. So. The intent of the panel really is uh, to discuss from uh, the widely uh, divergent, I would say, and wonderfully diverse backgrounds of our panel, uh, this fundamental question which has been brought into you know, much sharper relief around COVID, which is uh, the transition from uh, a focus on uh, shareholder value, which was you know, a concept that was more or less formalized universally by Milton Friedman in uh, in the 50s in the United States and really held sway for a very long time to a much broad, broader responsibility towards, uh, towards uh, a broader set of stakeholders with this broader society, whether it's the planet in terms of the environment uh, and all other forms of engagement with uh, people whom, with whom we interact and whom we impact but in, a, in whatever we do but who are not necessarily our, our financial co-partners and not therefore not necessarily our shareholders. So so that's, and I think that's a topic that impacts pretty much everyone. So I was not at all, uh, I would say worried that uh, nobody would be, or somebody would not be a right fit for this panel. I think everybody who is uh, a professional today, I think has, has relevance to these questions. So, uh, and I think, therefore, you know, we can look forward to a very interesting and uh, I would say lively discussion today. So having said that, uh, I'd like to start off with by quickly introducing myself and then I will ask my colleagues to introduce themselves because, again, I, as, as I keep saying, the most wonderful part of this panel is the the rich and diverse backgrounds of, uh, of people that you know, have been brought here uh, to talk on this important topic. So I, my, my name is Arun Sharma. I was the chief investment officer at the International Finance Corporation for the last, uh, where I've been for the last 28 years, for the last 12 years as CIO. I stepped down uh, last year to paint on a broader brush. And uh, so, and uh, since then I've been spending about half my time in uh, uh, business activities, advising a few global corporations like MasterCard, Standard Ventures, uh, uh, AXA Insurance, uh, 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 FNBC, the Japanese bank, and of course, my, my old company, IFC. And I spend uh, the other half of my time spending on social ventures. So I'm on the board of uh, a women's organization in India, which has about 2 million members. I'm uh, supporting uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies here in Washington, D.C. And I do a couple of, uh, of, you know, occasional engagements with environmental organizations like Conservation International and uh, and the Nature Conservancy uh, to support support some of their work uh, directly and also with my with my clients. So that's about me, and I will now hand over to my colleagues. Uh, so go ahead. Sorry, uh, you you know just uh, you, you know uh, just raise your hand and 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 uh, uh, please start. Okay, then. So I'll introduce myself. Please. I'm Vivian. I'm Brazilian, but I, I now I'm living in the U.S. Live in Miami. I'm one of the co-founders of BNT Group in Brazil. We are one of the largest exchange currency companies, so we're financial institution. And I'm yeah, I'm in the U.S. because um, I'm opening, launching the first international uh, branch for our financial institution. 
We also run a cryptocurrency exchange in Brazil. And now in about two weeks ago, we have just launched, uh, launched our uh, digital bank that it's a multi-currency bank with uh, Brazilian reais, cryptocurrency. Uh, the first currency we launched is Bitcoin and probably next currency will be US dollars. So um, I'm in a very uh, different um, business here. I've, I've always been in the compliance uh, area, actually. So I'm a compliance specialist for financial institution. And now I run the whole business here because when you start uh, a offshore, you start small. So we are a very big company, but still, but here we are a very small office. We have only five people and I run all the business, even commercial or administration business and the compliance business. So I'm still responsible for the company in Brazil for the area of compliance and um, governance. So I work, I work remotely for two years. So now remotely working is not uh, new for me since we started COVID. Everybody went to their homes and started working from their home. But I work from my home almost three years from now. Yes, almost three years. And well, I think that this, um, I also would like to thank Frank. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to hear all the panels. <laughs> I'm sure he's very busy, but he's um, very uh, competent and I'm, I'm very proud of him doing this uh, nice conference for all of us. So thank you again, Frank. And please, I think Effie was the first one when I arrived here at the, <laughs> at the meeting conference. So please. Sure. Thank, thank you so much um, for that nice segue to me. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here um, today. And, um, you know, I'm super excited about this panel and such diverse background. Um, I'm sure it will be very interesting. And of course, thanks to Frank um, for giving us this opportunity. Um, so um, I'm an investment lawyer and also the founder of Impact Her. Impact Her is an impact driven organization that helps um, prepare African female business owners to get access to institutional capital um, through trainings and also access to markets. Um, to date, we have trained over 13,000 women in 52 African countries. Um, and I studied impact as a result of my experience as an investment lawyer, primarily private equity, um, where I have helped um, structure over 1.3 billion into Africa. Um, so that's what brings me here today. Thank you, Afri. Thank you. Vanessa? Hi, all. It's a privilege to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm Ernesto Nunez Lagos. I was born in Mexico. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur for all my life. Uh, I have been in different uh, classes and, and for profit, uh, social impact and non-profit. Uh, I found I created my own uh, company and event uh, marketing and event firm since 2001, uh, in which we have produced more than 7,000 events for corporations and government. Uh, we produce events like the World Economic Forum in Mexico. We co-produced that advertising week and so many others. Uh, I developed a couple of companies, uh, toilet public toilet companies. Uh, with a triple footprint, uh, as well as some NGOs, one focused on, on a rise awareness for inclusion for people with uh, autism, and uh, as well as LGBT community. Here in Mexico, it's a, a large problem about inclusion, even though we are a very diverse country. So, uh, I, uh, this is me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Frank, and thank you all. Thank you. Sebastian, please. Yes, well, so welcome, everyone, uh, from Munich, uh, Germany. So normally at this time of the year, we'd all be celebrating Oktoberfest. Uh, right now, the only tent we have on that meadow is a COVID testing center, so it's a bit different this year. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it's very honored to be in, on this panel and a bit intimidated hearing all the impressive achievements and numbers. Um, I, I probably come from, from something a bit smaller. So I'm chief data scientist at OneLogic. We are a company specializing on data analytics and artificial intelligence. Um, so we're about a 150 uh, mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, astrophysicists, so, so, so also some sociologists and biologists, of course. And, um, <laughs> but all, all scientists. And um, our company specializes on forecasting. So basically trying to take large amounts of, of data um, for companies that could be sales or supply chains or something like that, and trying to use that data to predict the future. Um, so what, what will happen, how likely is it to happen? And um, also, of course, and, and I guess this is going to, to segue a bit into the topic we're talking about today, um, always asking the question, what, what is a business optimizing for? Because in the end, if we're trying to put, put a business into numbers and mathematical terms, of course, that's one of the questions we always have to deal with is, is what is the goal and um, what is everyone trying to achieve? So. Um, it's interesting to, to see some of the shifts I guess we're discussing on the panel today. So really looking forward to that. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Welcome. And I think I can see Chris, Christina. Christina, can you see us? As long as you can see and hear me, I think we're connected. Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, okay. I, I want to first recognize that we are fortunate enough to have Frank pop into our session. So Frank, I think everyone here has already uh, sung your praises and thanked you for having us. But if you're in the room, as I think you are, uh, thank you for having us. Um, so impressive to pull this off uh, this year. Um, so yes, my name is Christina Alfonso Arjan. Um, I am based in New York and I run a company called Madeira Global. Uh, for about a decade now, we have been focused on ESG reporting uh, for mostly uh, financial service firms um, in the alternative space, so private equity, venture capital, some hedge funds and credit funds, but um, um, again, mostly on the private side and, um, and some municipal bond uh, managers. And so the work that I've done over the last um, 10 years is, has largely focused on um, you know, measuring the importance of non-financial data. Um, and so um, I'm looking forward to contributing to this panel, but that's the work that I've done. And then the, the only other thing that I would add is that um, a good part of our work in, in recent years has actually been on advising fund managers on how to develop ESG investment strategies. So um, thanks for having me. Thank you, Christine. I'm glad uh, that technology worked. Uh, so uh, wonderful to have uh, actually everybody on the panel now. So, uh, you know, we have a uh, very limited left uh, number of time. We are off at, uh, we have exactly 32 minutes left as I'm counting. So I'll ask uh, Efe to start answering the first question. Uh, please keep your answer to three minutes and then uh, we'll go to Vivian and we'll go to Ernesto, Sebastian, and then on to uh, Christina. So close yours, Efe, please. Sure. Um, thank you so much. And I will try not to lawyer this question. <laughs> so um, with regards to, you know, what Impact Terra has been doing, if it has, you know, focused on shareholders or, you know, st stakeholders, we have um, sort of realigned to really focus um, to the broader lens of, you know, you know, the stakeholders and how and I will start from where we started pre-COVID, we were more focused on getting, you know, the group of women that we work with to really get access to finance, right? So we're thinking about the individual woman. But once COVID hit, we quickly realized that a lot of those businesses were now at risk of failing. For example, I believe um, the Kenyan CBN came out to say that 75% of their SMEs, as their small and medium-sized businesses, were at risk of failing um, should they not get the intervention that was needed. Um, on the other hand, we also, Impact also conducted a survey to understand the atmosphere, what was going on. Um, when that data came out, um, we got responded from 30 African countries. Um, it showed that about 80% of them were also, you know, nervous about shutdown. And that, you know, caused a broader panic for us because we know that 90% of jobs in Africa are really created by the small and medium-sized businesses. These are really the engines, the job engines for these economies. So as a result, it became apparent that we couldn't keep focusing on the individual, you know, woman that walks into the door and say, hey, I need help for the bit for my business. Rather, our intervention had to now be 
tweaked to focus on what will help them produce jobs, what would help them keep um, this um, SMEs running because Africa, the continent, needs them to survive for its own economic well-being. As a result, um, our interventions changed. We started providing them with um, websites to bring them online because a lot of them were not able to sell. Revenues were drastically cut. In, um, and if that happened, obviously they can't keep people employed. Uh, we started sort of providing them with advisory services, again, with a focus on trying to ensure that these advisory services would help um, minimize the costs on them and allow them to keep employing people, keeping people employed and producing for the economy. But what we then did in addition to that was that we then took a step out to say, now we have to even focus on the broader ecosystem. Um, so we wrote um, policy letters to about 30 African presidents, of which I'm glad to say four of them had responded, the president of Ghana, president of Namibia, president of Mozambique and Burkina Faso, responded to say, yes, we, 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 we acknowledge the policy recommendations you've made to create an enabling ecosystem for the small and medium-sized businesses, especially the women-led businesses. And this is what we have implemented. And this is what we're hoping to implement in the next few months. So at least some of those presidents took our recommendation into consideration to create this enabling environment, which hopefully will help to continue um, to allow this SME survive so that Africa itself, um, from an economic standpoint, can survive. Thank you. That's, uh, I have um, you know, many follow-ups for you, but uh, we'll uh, reserve that for once the questions are over. So, yeah, Vivian, <laughs> close the office. Uh, yeah. No, I was thinking that we live on the same planet, but we're, we're probably from very different worlds, every one of us. So, um, uh, my universe here, it refers to 250 employees. So it's a very small thing looking to Effie's universe of what she can reach uh, from uh, people that she can reach. So what we, we've been doing since um, BNT Group is, is started as a, fi a family company. So family companies, they usually are more uh, worried about their employees. When, when you're not too uh, prof I'm not, I don't mean professionalized like we, we are professional, but usually we keep the look, we keep our, our, our eyes to our employees. So this, our universe is smaller. And in this basis, since we started professionalizing the company, what well, we've been doing to, uh, mutuality, that is uh, the main, um, the main, subject of this uh, meeting, it was like we start sharing profit with our employees. This is, this is something that a lot of financial institutions in Brazil start doing, but not, uh, not all of them. And especially the biggest ones, it's very difficult for them to start doing that. And we start doing this with our, with our employees, and it was very, very, um, it changes a lot our universe in, in the company, inside of the company, because you when, you when you share profit, you don't share only the profit, you share also the responsibility. So people, they are more responsible to their, they, they feel more responsible and more autonomous to their jobs. And in a small company, it was very uh, clear that this was a very good uh, opportunity for all the employees. And also referring to the COVID, we decided uh, to avoid dismissals and avoid uh, firing people when we start doing that. And even um, from from a, a total of 250 employees, we we started with uh, in after three months of COVID, we had we we had to to fire. And we fired about 10% of the company. And in September, we start hiring again. And we decided to hire the same uh, employees that we had fired. So this is not, um, maybe if it was a very big company, maybe we couldn't have done that. But as it's a small company, it was very easy to us to make, to have this kind of control. And 
Well, this is these are small um, actions, but I'm sure that they are very uh, their value. They they bring us value to our business because employees they are more. Um, I mean, grateful, and it's not grateful because you're not doing any favor because it's a business is a relation. They work and you pay, but it's a it's it's a relation that starts being more faithful. I mean, you know, for for a kind of business in financial institution, there's a lot of um, um, rotativity. They change a lot of uh, of job. So when we do this kind of action, is uh, it. It keeps it keeps us more like like a, a big company, but it's a big family company. It's kind of that. Thank you. That's a very interesting what I call a micro perspective. So you know that's the that's the nice part of this kind of panel to have a much you know sort of continent level macro view from Ufe and a really mm -hmm. enterprise level view from uh, from Vivian. And I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know that that makes that's what makes it you know such a wonderful discussion. So I'll now pass on to Ernesto. You're muted, so please go ahead. Yes. As well as uh, experienced member card here in Mexico, as well as all of you have been uh, worldwide. You know? uh, from our from the very beginning, our businesses has been planned as a, a social responsibility business, except for the event and marketing company. We and you know, all the companies uh, have uh, around 75, 78 uh, employees. Can you just speak up a little bit, Ernesto? I think the line is not so good. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And this and is much better. Thank you. This is uh, we we are all seventy eight employees in the group of companies, and it has been very hard, uh, considering that we are uh, small companies as well. Uh, with a model of mutuality, we have try, been trying to hold uh, these employments as long as we can, but uh, it has a limit, no? So we are uh, six months away from, from the start of the, the COVID-19, and it is becoming very hard. Our businesses are, are you know, very complicated situation uh, considering that events are not running anymore and we are moving to a virtual platforms but uh, we're doing our best and about toilets we are operating at the 30 percent is that what our government allows to so it has been very hard uh, we are uh, looking for loans to extend this model uh, until january february of the next year and we think we, we will we will make it. We will accomplish. Uh, we just cut uh, twenty percent of our people, and it has been hard. But uh, we remain uh, providing them social security, sponsored by our by our companies, and it has been the best we can do. You now, as, as to share uh, our responsibility with, with all of them. You know? Thank you, Ernesto. That was again, uh, you know, very, very uh, clear and uh, I would say illustrative uh, comment on the micro level impacts or the enterprise level impacts of, of COVID-19 in, in Mexico and in your your business in particular, because, you know, so COVID-19 has this particular uh, trait of impacting certain co businesses that, that depend on congregation of humans. Uh, whether it's sports, uh, events, uh, cinemas, travel, leisure, all kinds of things. So, you know, I guess you're, in your situation, uh, you know, you're one of those uh, businesses which do rely on humans getting together uh, when it's an event business. So, yeah. so it is, you know, understandably difficult. But, you know, we really admire, you know, the approach you're taking in terms of uh, integrating mutuality in your response to handling this crisis. So, but we'll come back to that because again, there are many, many other follow-ups to that that I wanted to talk about. But I'll pass the floor now to Sebastian. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I mean, the, the question I guess was, uh, how has COVID uh, changed our approach towards mutuality? And I think that we've, uh, so this is also going to be a micro perspective. Um, we have, and which is unusual for an analytics and AI company, we are a bootstrapped company. 
So that means we have never taken any major outside investment or venture capital investment, um, which basically means that we need to grow from the revenue of our customers and um, we need to think really long term. We cannot afford to make spend any money that we don't have. And so we've, we've been prudent for many years. And so the sense how, how it has transformed our business and our approach to people, I think COVID hasn't really done much. Uh, so um, this, this has helped us, I think, uh, not financially necessarily, but, but in terms of cohesion of the people and cohesion with our customers um, to have a really good foundation to build on because it was never short term or transactional. Um, of course, um, what we are seeing, but I guess that, that goes already in the direction of the second question is um, that it, it has certainly impacted a lot our customers and we are working in a field that is focused very much on um, innovation, of course, and, and the ironic thing is I think that in a time where innovation is probably more important than ever, um, everybody's saving their budgets on exactly that that part, right, because it's, it's, it's the non-essential part and so um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, renegotiation and basically trying to figure out, you know, how can we, how can we make innovative uh, projects, approaches still happen in a time when everybody's just scrambling to, to survive and, and getting everybody ready. And so, so it's an interesting, uh, yeah, two, two orthogonal forces that we're, that we're feeling a lot. Right? Yeah. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, that's very interesting. And I would say... <clears throat> real-time perspective that you know we see in my many of my clients uh, play out uh, and there, i think there are some more interesting angles to that but we'll come back to that uh, hopefully if we have some time we are uh, but you know i'll pass the floor to christina if she can still see us yeah there she is go ahead christina uh yes um my my response is similar to sebastian's i think our clients take a long-term perspective so we haven't necessarily had um a direct impact yet, but I will extend my response perhaps to what I'm witnessing within our client base. So again, I, I said earlier, our client base is mostly alternative uh, asset managers. And um, I think as they have been impacted, um, you know, we are a service company. And so um, if they are trying to make sure that they don't have to let go of their own employees, one of the first things that they're going to do is start to cut um, you know, out, out external service providers. Um, and so uh, we have we have seen some loss, although the nature of our work being sort of ESG reporting, they can't afford to stop reporting on the assets uh, that they currently manage um, as, um, you know, that would be sort of negligent in terms of their commitment to their existing investors. So uh, we're fortunate in that sense, but I do see uh, perhaps a, a ripple effect down, down the line that, that might have might affect it and i think you know we started this year in 2020 at the davos which you know was able to go on just because of how early it was relative to when the world kind of discovered how serious this case would be and they issued the 50th anniversary davos manifesto right talking about the importance of uh, stakeholder capitalism and that it was no longer about just the shareholders but about how um, all stakeholders needed to be provided value, and that was the that was the responsibility of all businesses. So my hope is that that is something that will continue to be the case. What I'm reading and what I'm seeing sometimes contradict, meaning I'm told ESG has never been more important to businesses, but I'm seeing companies cut budgets again to to, to spare their you know their own employees. So a little bit of both. Thank you, Christina. That was that was uh, candid and insightful. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, uh, now, uh, you know, we we are already at four o'clock, uh, you know, by the time I was hoping to get uh, some audience questions, but we, I don't see any on the screen. Uh, I don't think it's a technology issue. It's, we probably have uh, some audience listening carefully, but not necessarily asking questions. But if people are listening, please, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, you can just post them on, uh, on the screen and... Uh, Panelists will be able to see them uh, on the side panel. Uh, I don't see any, so so we'll use this time to for me to ask some uh, some follow ups from the very very insightful and uh, I would say you know uh, uh, knowledgeable comments that I've received. So the first one uh, is for uh, and they all relate to really the more forward looking perspective. Uh, so the first one uh, for was really. 
in your in your interactions with your uh, your client base with the women entrepreneurs in in Africa uh, what do you see uh, as if any as an emerging trend in terms of uh, uh, mutuality in terms of collaboration in this face of adversity do you feel uh, people have become more responsive in uh, initiatives and and asks that that involve a little bit of you know uh, contribution from from them as as say members of your network or people su- receiving support uh, or do you see you know uh, a desire to hunker down and try to survive uh, uh, you know, is there is there any discernible trend that that you're observing? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I I would say that it depends on the businesses. We've seen a mixture of both, right? Where you know, obviously, for one, survival is key, right? So it's almost like you know, whatever they have to do today to make um, to to make sure the business survive, they will do. Um, but also, we've also been seeing a lot of collaboration and collaboration amongst them that, you know, we have this platform of over 2,000 of them where they go in and chat to each other. And you notice a lot of cross trade, a lot of collaboration. Um, and also the fact that they are thinking about each other as par- as all players in an ecosystem as opposed to just being an individual whose business needs to survive. So we're, we're experiencing both of them, but it really depends on the sectors. Um, while others are also trying to pivot and those that are trying to slightly pivot to respond to what the economy needs. Um, so for example, where hand sanitizers were needed, you found a lot of them that made detergents were pivoting to that because they cared about the health and safety. And of course it was an economic opportunity, but you found them also trying to collaborate with other ecosystem players. Thank you very much. I mean, I think I have a similar question for, for Vivian. Uh, you know, I know you're involved in a digital bank and, uh, you know, in, in a number of fintech type uh, uh, aspects of, of your business. And uh, so one of the questions I had was that given what we are seeing in COVID and given the fact that, you know, you have to convert a lot of uh, a lot of people to the new ecosystem, to the new way of doing this. I mean, the millennials are all easier to convert, but not everybody is so easy. So are you seeing kind of a more of a collaborative attitude, you know, given that we are all facing this adversity and one of the solutions to us kind of a more efficient and frankly now physically safer way of doing financial activities is uh, the digital space. Uh, uh, Do you see kind of a change in attitude in terms of regulators and uh, others in terms of saying, look, we we are facing this kind of challenge and, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, we should be a little more encouraging to these new initiatives than than we were before, or or is it still very much the same attitude? Because I know no, Brazil. No. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, uh, Brazil is a very has a very specific uh, regulation for financial institution, but um, I think the Brazilian Central Bank is very uh, collaborative with the fintech. We now have a regulation for fintech, and I think the the in the essence the digital banks they are willing to uh, get a little bit little bit of the space of the big banks. In Brazil, we have four big banks, and they charge whatever they want for the customers. So um, we have almost forty five percent of the. Um, of the country non-banked. I know in Mexico it's much bigger. I heard that almost 90% of the of the countries. I mean, um, I think the in the essence, digital bank, they're offering better services for better cost. And I think this is already a mutuality for the customers. And even for the, the employees, they are willing to transform the, the financial system. So we now have uh, more than, I think, seven or eight digital banks. It, it looks a uh, few, but it's more than the regular, the traditional, that are four or five, I guess. So, and the, the, they, are, they are doing very good. They are receiving a lot of investments. We, we have just launched, and we are, in, I mean, in one week, we had 5,000 customers. This is a lot for us. 
this is this is a lot. We have uh, and we have very few because we are launching a bank with our own uh, resources, with our own financial resources. We don't have any investors, any big investors. So this is a very big step. So you can see that you can launch a bank with your own resources of a, of a, a small company that we are. And this is all because of the regulation that is uh, much easier now. So it, the market is going to be much more democratic than it was uh, a few years ago. And I think this is very good for customers and for the whole community itself. So, and, and as you asked, yes, the, the regulation is being modified and it's being uh, more flexible for these banks. It doesn't mean that we don't have to have uh, um, AML uh, regulation. We do have everything. But even though we have, it's being more like that you, ha you need less capital to launch a bank or you can make partnership with banks that are not for retail and they want to enter the retail services. So it's been very good. And technology is, is being um, very well received in Brazil because a lot of people, they don't have um, bank accounts, but they have a mobile phone with Internet. So it's much easier for them to have now a bank account as they have a mobile with Internet because you don't need too much. You just need to make your, your own uh, register. It's online. You take pictures of the document. So I think, I think this is a very good uh, way for the modernization of the banking system in Brazil and not in Brazil, but I think the whole world. We also work with international remittances for uh, family remittances. It's a very big, big service that we work. And we can see that from Brazil and to Brazil, how the market is changing. We used to have a lot of Brazilian immigrants working abroad and sending uh, financial resources to their families in Brazil. Now, Brazilian economy cannot, maybe it's not too good, but it's better than a lot of countries in Latin America. And now we are receiving a lot of immigrants that send money abroad. They work in Brazil and they send money to their customers. So all, also these, this remittance financial service like uh, TransferWise and TransFast. I mean, there's a lot of them that are all digital and they all, all work very well globally. So they're also making a very big part in the financial community because you can uh, share the the sorry about that <laughs> no problem <laughs> you you were able to share the the earnings so if you were money in brazil but you were able to send money to your country i mean brazil is receiving a lot of uh immig haitian immigrants right now so, Wait, well, yeah, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think this is exactly I got my answer. I think so. I think what I what I was connecting was the 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 whole. Uh, the, I think the the importance of fostering mutuality, you know, by by the use of digital technology, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that uh, the dependence and the ability to you know fight fight COVID uh, by not contacting each other for. Uh, financial business, but simply doing everything online is a tremendous, tremendous yes. power. I think of, of what what you're doing, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, uh, you know, the same support is going to you know be worldwide. So, Ernesto, I had a question for you uh, very quickly because I know we have only about five minutes left. So, if you can just keep your answer to a couple of minutes, and the question is very straightforward. Just in terms of your toilet business, which is a public service business, it's a public toilet. Is there is there a effort on the part of government because you know it is a kind of a public private partnership? I would say by definition, in some ways, uh, is there is there a kind of because it is a quite important from a, I would say public service perspective in this difficult time. What is their attitude? Are they trying to support you and to maintain the service? Uh, you know, in this difficult time. Uh, well, at, at this moment, we have a, I could say, not the best government in Mexico. It's a populism government. 
so it, it has not handled the, the situation uh, uh, the better way we could expect. We have a, a, a public, a private public association for the public toilets in, in some of the infrastructure in which we operate. And uh, the, we, we have not supported at all, no? not even us, uh, anybody. So what we have done is uh, to look for, for make leverage of our alliances with corporations that have been our main customers for 20 years. And they are the main sponsors for our projects. And, and we, we, that way we, we managed to solve the situation uh, and, and then in, in, in the uh, options of our customers, we have different kind of companies. No, I mean, an American Express or Microsoft that have been uh, very consciousness about mutuality and they, they help uh, our projects and many others no? uh, in, in this sense no? toward this trend of, of mutuality or some other companies uh, that they don't at all. So uh, from May to, to this moment, there has been a lot of uh, movements about pink washing, green washing uh, in, in the society, uh, asking for companies and government to, 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 to say, hey, we exist the whole year, no? not just for, for a season. We need help. We, we need to help each other to, to move forward from this crisis because uh -huh. Here in Mexico, has been very hard. No, uh, our economy is uh, has a contraction about eighteen percent just for the second part of the year. It, it's a lot. No, I mean, I believe worldwide is the same situation, but uh, the government is is not the ideal government for this time. Okay. <laughs> Understood. Thank you. Well, but you know, I said this is gives. I think a interesting perspective of how important I think your governance and government is, especially in infrastructure and it's public it's services. It's uh, so. Ethical, no? yeah. ethics. Yeah. I mean, it's, it depends on. Sure, sure. Sebastian, one quick question. I know we have probably almost running out of time. So just in terms of the demand for analytics data, now the fact that uh, COVID is kind of such a I don't know how you call it in data science terms, but it's such an exogenous shock of, I would say, uh, you know, that was, I think, theoretically unpredictable in some ways. I mean, I don't think there was any model a year ago that was based on any data, whatever we had was actually predicting, predicting COVID. So is there going to be a, a shift in the kind of mental thinking or attitude of data science and predictive analytics to kind of focus on these, you know, I would say deep black swan events, you know, I don't, I can't even call this a black swan event. I mean, this, I don't know what color of swan this is. But I think that's one of the advantages of the computer versus the human, right? The computer right. can never predict things it hasn't seen before. So right. um, now, you know, if we have a second wave, we'll be much better with the data to predict things. <laughs> but um, no, I, I, I think, you know, this, this is one of, of the of the things where we know that the robots won't win uh, because, right. you know, we humans have, have all the creativity to think up scenarios that, that have, or uh, in this case, probably we didn't, but uh, things that have never happened in the past. So I think analytics is, is going to be more concerned with the cleanup work that now needs to be done. Uh, because, you know, we, we always used to say anybody can predict the sales of toilet paper. And even that turned out to be completely false after COVID. So, um, <laughs> we, we, we have to start new in some, uh, some spaces yeah. here. Yeah. So again, I think, again, I think so the scope for mutuality here is, uh, I think going to be more important because you'll need to collect all kinds of data to do all kinds of creative new forms of modeling. Oh uh, yes. To uh, to do you know the kind of work we need to do to stay alive, so to speak. Uh, you know we really need to uh, close out. I'm getting uh, a prompt saying we have only 22 seconds left. So let me you know I'm sorry I cannot go to Christina for a last last round question. I have to wrap up. So I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for a, I think, very enriching, very lively discussion. And it's always wonderful to see so many different perspectives from so many different parts of the world. And I, in closing, I want to say thank you and wish you all the best in all the wonderful things you are doing. And hopefully all of you do well and stay safe. Thanks again for joining. Thank you.
Thank you. Great Thank you, everybody. everybody. Nice to meet Have you. A great day. Bye. 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 Mm-hmm. <sighs>